What's the most challenging thing about RV life? Do I ever feel unsafe? Am I happy with my 38 foot 2005 motorhome? And do I ever talk to Paul? All that and more when I answer your questions next. Welcome to the channel. I'm Liz. I'm a full-time RVer. I've been on the road for four and a half years and this is my first Q&A. Thank you for asking all these questions. I stopped counting at 78 questions or probably was close to 100. Most of them were on the community page. If you did not get a notification that I posted on the community page, that just means you need to ring the bell and you'll see whenever I post. So there were several on personal safety. So what about your personal safety, like strange people walking into your camp uninvited? Do I ever feel unsafe? How do I feel safe as a single woman in RV life? I really feel fine. I stay in gated campgrounds, typically thousand trails. And if you've never been in campgrounds, there's a sense of community. I feel like that we all have each other's backs. If I need anything, like if I need to borrow a ladder or if I need help with anything, there's always someone there. There's always somebody looking out for me and I feel like we're all looking out for each other. I've had no bad incidences. Now, I also tried boondocking, but I don't think I would boondock just totally by myself. I boondocked and camped next to friends, and I think that's the way to do it. I think the best way for solo RVers to travel, if you're gonna boondock, is to travel in a caravan. I mean, there's definitely safety in numbers. This next question I found pretty interesting. If you were stopped by a law officer on the side of the road, and were asked if maybe you have cash or drugs, et cetera, in your RV, would you give permission to the officer for a search of your home on the road, knowing they might find an infraction somewhere and they might confiscate your home and leave you stranded? I have to say I haven't given it any thought. I, I don't have anything to hide, so I don't know. I think I would like to hear from you as to what you think I should do in that situation. I have a 2005 38 foot Alpha. This is camper number nine for me. And yes, it's big, but I find it very easy to drive. That was one of the questions. How hard is it to drive? I don't have any problems backing it or maneuvering it at all. It's easy to get in the site and out of the site. The first few times I drove on the interstate, I was white knuckle driving. I have gotten more used to it now. Also, I don't go as fast. I go about 59, 62, maybe max. I think when you're towing, you should be below 65 anyway. Way. So I'm just going a few miles an hour slower. I feel safer. It's a lot of weight going down the road. I'm over 30,000 pounds. I did a video about driving a motorhome, making it easier. So definitely check that out. I'm basically driving a billboard down the road. So I look at the forecast and if there's high winds, I will just change my travel day to the next day or whenever the wind storms go. And if I find myself in a place like a canyon where there is high winds, I definitely slow down. I'm not afraid to go as slow as I need to be in order to be safe out there. And several people asked about the truck too. I do love the truck. It is my daily driver. When I went from the one ton and the fifth wheel to the F-150 and the motorhome, my fuel usage went down. That's because I'm not traveling that frequently. I'm not moving every two and three days. I'm actually moving every couple weeks. And so the fuel usage on the Ford, it has an EcoBoost. It is much, much more efficient. Lots of questions about repairs and maintenance. Should I have gotten an inspection? That kind of thing. Do I do the repairs myself? No, I don't. There's a saying in the RV industry, either you become handy or you go broke. So hopefully I won't be going broke, but yes, I pay someone to fix the rig. I can do minor things. And I do think it's important to have money set aside for that. A lot of people make the mistake of spending their entire budget on the camper and then they have nothing set aside for repairs. And not just for repairs, you wanna set aside some money for upgrades. You're gonna wanna make that RV or camper your own. And that's why Brooklyn Bedding is sponsoring this video. When I bought my brand new 2020 Grand Design fifth wheel. It was a Reflection 260RD. I cratered that mattress within three weeks. 
So everyone does this. It's the number one upgrade. You could spend $400,000 on a motorhome and still need to get a new mattress. Those mattresses are cheap. So I actually cratered it. I made a big divot in just three weeks of sleeping on it. I've been sleeping on a Brooklyn bedding mattress for the last year. I had it in my fifth wheel. I left it behind and then I got a Brooklyn bedding mattress again in my motorhome. I find I wake up with no aches and pains and I used to before Brooklyn bedding. And the one I have now is the Aurora Lux. It has a chill pad on top. I'm a hot sleeper. And so when I wake up and I'm hot, I just roll over and I just go right back to sleep. So RV Mattress is a line by Brooklyn Bedding that is focused on RVers. That means that they have all the different mattress sizes like King Short and Queen Short and they'll ship directly to you. This is so wonderful for being on the road. There's even free shipping. Now, the mattresses are made in Arizona. You get them pretty quick. There's a 120 night sleep trial and a 10 year warranty. The mattresses can be kind of heavy, so you might want to get some help if you're a solo, but it's definitely worth it. It's kind of fun to watch them unroll and they puff up. Now, RV Mattress by Brooklyn Bedding is going to be running some great sales leading up to Memorial Day, so definitely check it out. And you can use my special link to get 25% off. Go to rvmattress.com slash lizamazing, put in the code lizamazing, and you'll save 25%. By the way, this is my absolute favorite camper that I've ever had. I absolutely love it. If I could do cartwheels, I would be doing them in this rig. I love it that much. So I did a couple years of research before I bought my motorhome. I definitely wanted the sweet spot of like 2001 to 2007 in the motorhome years. And in fact, those are high quality years for many, many items. After that, death came in, then the Great Recession, then we had COVID, so that all affected the RV industry and not in a good way. I'm really, really happy with my motorhome. They don't build them like they used to. And should I have gotten an inspection? Well, yes and no. I really feel like I was destined to have this motorhome. So even if I learned about some things that needed to be done as far as maintenance, I think I still would have bought it. At least my eyes would have been a little wider open and I would have known about the issues, but I absolutely still would have bought it. And I do recommend getting an inspection so you know what you're getting into. Motorhomes do require more maintenance than most campers, so you need to be prepared for that. One way that you can kind of slow down the money leaving your bank account is to travel less because when you travel, that's when things happen where you feel like, oh my gosh, I've got to fix it now. What advice could you give to another single female who wants to RV but claims she can't drive anything bigger than a Class B? Well, I think you just work your way up a little bit. I started full-time life in a 21-foot camper van. If you're comfortable with that, maybe go up to 24 feet. Work your way up. For me, I went from that to a 30-foot fifth wheel. I felt comfortable with that. You have to know yourself and know your own comfort level. I did do a video a couple years back about going to RV driving school which I did when I had the fifth wheel I do recommend that they'll come out to you give yourself time to go out there and practice like when I got the class A I took it out to a parking lot several times and practiced okay I love this next one if you had the power to change a law what would it be and why? Isn't that a great dinner party question? So many different things that come up, but the thing that came up first, the top of my mind is Washington's five car law. If I am causing traffic to pile up behind me, then I need to pull over. That's common courtesy. I do that all the time, of course. No one wants to be behind me when I'm going slow up a hill, but Here's where I have a problem with it. The law does not say if I'm going the speed limit or not. Basically, from what I've done in my research is, even if I'm going the speed limit, if I have a bunch of cars behind me, I need to get off the road and let them pass. So if I'm driving, I find it very difficult to count those cars behind me. The only way I can do that is if I'm making a curve and I'm trying to count them in my mirror as I'm making that curve. I'm not gonna be able to see them lined up behind me any other way. So I don't like that that's now my burden to count. 
And then two, if I'm going the speed limit, I don't feel like I should pull over. So that's my only problems with it. When I'm going slow, when I notice people behind me, I absolutely pull over. But if I'm going the speed limit or if I can't count or, you know, or, or if it's unsafe for me to try and count the cars, then I just don't want to have to pull over. That law is in Washington and Alaska. That's as far as I know. It may be in other states. Let me know your thoughts on that. What is the most challenging thing about RV life? I would have to say it's internet. It's really important to me to connect, to be able to answer the comments, to upload videos, that kind of thing. In fact, I have a dedicated video I'm working on that's coming up that's going to be all about what I do for internet. And it includes more than one thing. It includes several things. So definitely check that out next week. So I got a lot of questions about travel. How far in advance do I plan my stays? Where am I going? When am I coming to the East Coast? When am I coming to Canada? Am I ever going to Australia? What's my favorite spot in California? So I did spend a year on the East Coast and now I've made it back to the West Coast. I will be here for the rest of this year. I have not even thought about 2024. But here's how I do my planning. The week between Christmas and New Year's, I do the entire year. I map it out. I don't necessarily make the reservations, but I map it out. That's my rough guideline. And I did a video talking about trip planning. And basically you want to begin with the end in mind. So I, all I have to do is decide where do I want to end up? Where do I want to winter? And then I work backwards. So that's pretty easy. This year I'm going to be in Oregon and also going to be in Montana, Colorado, and Arizona. So I'm kind of making a little looper around and absolutely if you see me come out and say hi as far as Canada I'm hoping to get to Canada in August I absolutely is on my bucket list as far as Australia and Europe wouldn't that be cool to plan a trip maybe do a group Liz amazing trip over there I don't know I would need a sponsor or need some way to make a group trip happen but that would be something in the works for the future I'm, I'm definitely open to it Got several questions about food. How do I cook? Do I cook in the rig? Do I go out to eat? What do I do? Well, I eat a lot of salads and a lot of protein shakes for lunch and dinner. I eat pretty light. I cook breakfast every day, but generally don't cook the rest of the day. I very rarely eat out. I like to eat healthy and I'm a light eater. Lots of questions about Paul. So if you're one of the 15,000 people that subscribed to the channel in the last five or six months, Paul is my former boyfriend. So I started this channel as a solo RVer for like the first six months. Then Paul came into my life for about two and a half years and then we split up. And people are asking, well, how's he doing? How's he doing? Well, you probably know that he struggled with PTSD and the breakup actually was the best thing for him because it really forced him to get the help he needed that he was in denial about. He'll tell you that himself, that he is so glad because he is doing really great right now. And yes, we do talk. There are some more personal things I want to share and I've decided as this channel has gotten so big now, I just don't feel comfortable. I don't think that YouTube is the place for super personal information. So that's another reason why I have the Patreon community. That's a nice, safe, intimate place where I can share more and you can hear more. And particularly if you've been with this channel through thick and thin, oh my gosh, for three and a half years, there's been a lot happening and um, so absolutely check out the Patreon. It's as low as $5 a month and you'll get some more personal scoop and there's definitely some, some big news coming up. So definitely check that out. So I got several questions about budget and how much does it cost to do RV life? Well, I have to say that full-time RV living is as affordable as you want it to be. And what I mean by that is you can do it super, super cheap or you can actually do it lavishly. You just have to find your own comfort zone. I did a recent video how you can camp for seven months for a total of $180. That's in Quartzsite, Arizona, so it's like 25 bucks a month. You have water and sewer access. You do need to bring your own power, a generator, solar, that kind of thing. But I do love that this is open to anyone and it can be at whatever is your comfort level. If you've enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and share 
here. Let me know what law you would love to have changed or any other questions that you might have in the comments. As always, these are exciting times to push past fear, build confidence, and live amazing.